Welcome to today's teaching, which is part two of Tonsils and Tendencies. And last time, or in the first half of this teaching, um, I spoke to you about tonsils in the olden days, when I was a kid, um, that when the doctors removed them, they used something akin to a, a crochet hook, something that looked like that, to actually hook the tonsil out by its roots. However, often, well not often, but sometimes a part of it would be left behind and it, ha it was able to grow from that into an adult tonsil. And you can get adult tonsillitis, even if you had your tonsils out as a child, if they used that kind of implement. Apparently it doesn't happen anymore, so everybody under 20 or so can say thank God for that. So um, that was the, and I was likening that to having having a tonsil that where the root remains growing into an adult tonsil um, that we can have something very similar happen to us in the realm of the spirit because if we have been delivered from something it has the power to re-root itself in our lives and where I had finished last week I was speaking about uh, the way in which things can be uprooted um, but if the, a tiny bit of the root remains, it, you can revert to that at some point in your life. And I recall the one time a, a lady who is, has passed away subsequently, passed away a number of years ago. But this lady was called a prophetess because she gave individual words to people. Now, there are real prophets to the nation, such as Ziggy Oblanda, who does give personal words, but also is a prophet to the nations and speaks to, to, nation, to churches in many nations and gives the current word of the Lord. But this other lady was somebody who operated more in words of knowledge. And so she would call a prayer line and was prepared to pray for people for hours and hours and hours. And so what I found as I observed her ministry and ministered alongside her, um, and when I was the leader of his church, she came to the church there a number of times at my invitation. But I began to get really troubled by the fact that she would pray for people for hours. And one time in a conference, uh, not a conference in Durban, a conference, uh, a women's conference elsewhere, um, I did the first session. And I really felt that in that session, God was saying that there was not to be personal ministry. That instead, we were to just, the speakers were to preach the word. And I had the authority to do that because I'd been given the authority. That the speakers were to speak and then get people to respond um, and not to have personal words. And this this lady who loved God, but who got her whole identity from giving individual words to people, so that people actually became reliant on that. She was very unhappy with that. And she eventually came and said to the person whose church we were ministering in, well, I might as well not minister. And the, the lead person said, why do you say that? And she said, because I've got lots of followers here and they're coming here specifically to get a word. And the lead pastor said, uh, but they're getting the word. They're getting the word of the Lord as each of you ladies preach. But she wanted, she needed that thing of being able to minister to women. But I found in, uh, in the meetings that I led um, in his church, I found that these were very detrimental because I saw women in the church, women I knew, women I had ministered to, women I had walked with, who had been delivered specifically from rejection, but other things as well. But she would spend ages with each one. And it was she was ministering in the realm of the emotions. And I remember her holding on to one woman who had actually had a problem with rejection her whole life, as I did, but who had been delivered, totally delivered, and was walking in freedom. And instead, as she, the, the, the prophetess prayed for her, as she began to say, Oh, Lord, you know where my sister was vapped, because she spoke about the vapor when Paul uh, put his hand uh, or, or rather was gathering firewood and this thing, this serpent came out and attached itself to him and he shook it off into the fire. But she, if she talked about people hurting you and called it the viper biting you. And so she would say, you've been vapped. And as she said this to the specific woman who I knew very, very well and whose life story I knew, 
she fell down on the floor and she began to sob as if her heart would break. And it was just as if in that emotional realm, all the deliverance that she'd received was just taken right away from her. And she reacted the same way as she had years before when she was initially prayed for. And I I had to stand by and watch as one woman after another had wounds reopened. And you see, we that, that was just really wrong. But we can reopen wounds ourselves when we go back and talk about things that have happened to us. Um, and something that really struck me so forcibly, and I just love it, is if you look at Genesis chapter 40 and verse 15. But before you look there, the background to this is Joseph. And those of us who read our Bibles or those of us who go to church know that Joseph um, had two vis- or two dreams when he was just a young when he was just a young boy, maybe a, a young teenager. And in these dreams, he saw his father, mother, and brothers bowing down before him. He, the, the, he didn't actually see them. He saw the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him, and he saw all these sheaves. But his was the main sheaf, and everybody the other sheaves were bow, bowing down to him, and that caused his brothers to be extremely jealous of him. His father also favored him and had a coat of many colors made specifically for him. And so he was his father's favorite. He told, he told on his brothers. Um, Renee always says, my poodles tell on her. If she does something, they come along to me and look sad. And then I know she's done something to them. Just teasing. She's really very good to them, but that's what she says. But this, but Joseph told on his brothers and, um, so he, he was really out of favor with his brothers who were jealous of him. And so we know how they sold him into slavery and he went down to Egypt and in Egypt, he became a slave in Potiphar's house. And he was so faithful and so good at what he did that Potiphar, by the way, the Bible also tells us how handsome he was. So he was a very good looking strapping young man and Potiphar's wife, took a fancy to him, and she kept on coming on to him and trying to get him to sleep with her. And he said to her, he just said, how can you ask, you know, I could never do this to my master. He said he's entrusted everything to me. He doesn't withhold one thing from me except you, you know, his wife. Um, And he just, he was able to avoid her and avoid her. Um, But then one day he landed up alone in the house with her and she said to him, come to bed with me. And and he he was so afraid of her, uh, uh, you know, he fled sin. Um, And he left his garment in her hands where she pulled at him and he just wiggled out of his garment and got away. And so that incensed her. And she made an outcry and said to the servants and then to her husband, look at this Hebrew that you brought into this house. He's come in to molest me. And Potiphar was so angry at Joseph, um, because his wife had told this lie about him, that he had him cast into prison and he was put in a dungeon. But even in the dungeon, he, uh, he was found to be so faithful and so just so good at everything that the, the governor of the jail put him in charge of all the other prisoners. And so it says the Lord was with J- with Joseph, whatever he did, and he found favor. So he found favor with Potiphar. He found favor in the prison. Now he was there for a lengthy period of time. And one one year, um, the, the king, the pharaoh, put his chief cupbearer and his baker in prison. The Bible doesn't tell us why. It just says they displeased pharaoh. And then these two men, each had a dream on the same night. And Joseph saw them looking concerned in the morning because these dreams had been so vivid, obviously. So he asked them what was wrong with them. And they each told him their dream. And so he interpreted the dream for them. And the one was that the cupbearer was going to be restored within three days, but the baker was going to be executed. But after he'd given them the interpretation, this is where we read this. So in Genesis chapter 40, verse 15, This is what Joseph said. He said, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. I'm going to actually back up and read the the verse before that. Because he says, 
Um, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. And that's when he says, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. And when you look at the language that he used, he put it in the passive voice. This is what was done to me. What he did not do was say, my dirty, rotten, jealous brothers sold me to the Ishmaelites and I was made a slave and he didn't do any of that. He just said, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. So he doesn't assign blame to anybody. And yet we know that he, it must have hurt him because when his brothers arrived, he hid himself from them. And you know how, this, how the, uh, the account we read in Genesis about what he did. You know, he seated them in order, youngest to oldest, um, and so on. But um, he took one, of, but you can read the whole story yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to get on and take ages explaining that. But anyway, the point I'm making here is that he didn't blame his brothers, even though he was hurt. Because later on, by his actions, we see that he was still carrying something towards him, but he kept it to himself. And in that way, he didn't stir up the wounds of the past. And he didn't use his position to try to take vengeance on them. Um, he said, I was forcibly carried away from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, and he doesn't say, Potiphar's wife told a big lie about me. And she's such an evil woman. He said, even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. And see, this is the way in which we can guard ourselves. If something has hurt us, we can guard ourselves by not talking about it to all and sundry. Um, I had a relative. I don't want to say who this person was at all. But, um, but I had a relative who had been badly, badly treated in their life before they became saved. And um, when they became saved, that was actually something that was completely done away with, like they were a new person and they knew it and spoke about Jesus all the time. But over time, their habits of continually speaking about what had been done, um, and they also reverted to drinking. And the more they drank, the sadness and the sorrow of the past came up and they would weep again. Now, they'd been completely delivered from that. And the good news is that as the drinking stopped um, and more forgiveness was extended, they were able to completely change and not refer to it again. But I saw what happened to this person because one person after another would speak would speak to them and then they would talk, you know, say what happened to you and then they would talk about what had happened to them. And um, I know that in my own life, I have given testimonies now and again but I've made a point of not ever doing, giving my testimony in a church or in any kind of meeting. I do not give my testimony on a regular basis because every time I give it, it's actually something that I've got to pray through and deal with. And speaking about the stuff I used to do, it's, it's not a pleasure to me. I do it with the full intention of getting people saved. That is my motivation, because many people have got saved or delivered listening to my testimony. And that's the only time I'll do it. I don't do it just for fun, and they've, or just because somebody's interested. Um, I actually have to be led of the Holy Spirit to do it, because I do not want to talk about those things. They are over, they're done, it's in the past. When I got baptized, I felt as if I had really died to the person I had been, and now I have new life in Christ. But I've seen in the Word, and I've seen in people, and I want to go to the Word first. I've seen in the Word so many times when pe where people had an issue beforehand, God sanctified, but there's a root, like a tonsil root. There's a root of that iniquity left within them, which can rise up again. And I want to look first of all at Peter. And you know, we know how God used Peter so mightily. That in the um, that on the day of Pentecost, he was the one that was chosen by God. He was a he was the one who was set apart to actually preach the gospel. The first one to preach the gospel to the Jews, and the other eleven stood with him. But he was the spokesman. He was the person who spoke out. Um, when the Gentiles in Acts chapter ten, and I've spoken about this in a previous teaching, but when um, Cornelius sent. God said to him, send to Peter, he's staying with Simon the Tanner, and tell him to come. 
He could, God could have told him to go to anybody, but he said go to Peter specifically. And so when Peter came and he preached the gospel to them, the Holy Spirit fell on the hearers exactly the same way as the Holy Spirit had fallen on the 120 Jews who had been in the upper room. And Peter was able to say, well, that God's given the same gift to the Gentiles. Now we know he doesn't have favorites. He's, he's showed his mercy to all nations. And so Peter was the one who preached the gospel first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. He was the one who went back to Jerusalem. And when he was questioned and criticized for having gone to the Gentiles, he gave an absolutely clear, unbiased version, unvarnished version of what had happened. Um, and, you know, when God tells you in one chapter, this is what happens. And then a chapter or so later, the person relates what had happened. I've, I've sometimes I thought, God, why do you need to? Why do we need to read all of that again? And um, over the years, I've learned things as I've asked these questions, and I know that it's because God wants us to know that the person who reported on that gave an accurate report. You actually are told what they said. And it's an absolutely accurate account. And so Peter accurately told what had happened. And so we know that at that time, the early time of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, Peter had lost his fear of man. We know he had a fear of man because um, he was the one who denied three times, even though he promised Jesus. He said, I'll follow you even to death. And yet when Jesus' trial was taking place, three times he denied that he knew Jesus. And yet we read later, and I'm not even going to go to the scripture, Renee will put it, put it up for me. Um, but we read that when that Paul actually confronted Peter to his face, it says that when, when he said, when Peter, he said, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But then when this was in Antioch, and he said, but when men came from James, from the Jerusalem church, and they, began, they were the law keepers, the ones who wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised, he said, Peter began to eat, began not to eat with the Gentiles any longer. And he said, by his hypocrisy, he even led Barnabas astray. And then ultimately, all the, the Jews wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. And so Peter's fear of man rose up again and it threatened to divide the church. Moses had an anger issue early on in his life, saw an Egyptian fighting a, 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 Israel, a Hebrew, killed him, hit him in the sand. You even see when, when that he was angry with God sometimes and he said to God, um, did I ask for this? Did I ask you to carry all these people on my shoulders the way, you know, and, and he goes off. Um, and so he, he's a person who will get angry even with God, but he was delivered of that. However, at the end of his, of his ministry, he lost the opportunity to enter the promised land because he lost his temper again. God said to him, speak to the rock. Previously, he had said, strike the rock. And that is symbolic of Jesus being struck with that hammer as he was being nailed to the cross. So it was demonstrated that as Jesus was crucified water, living water would flow from him. And that's the, the spirit whom we are given. And so then God wanted to show that as time comes on, you just have to speak. Because the Holy Spirit was given and the evidence was speaking in tongues. So he said to Peter, speak to the rock. But Peter lost his temper with the people, and in a fit of fleshly anger, he's, he hit the rock twice, which would almost mean Jesus needs to be crucified twice, you know, once and then again. Um, and so God said to him, that has just cost you the promised land. You dishonored me in front of the people. And so I could just go on and on, but I can't. <laughs> so please look at things that you've been delivered from that maybe have been wounds that have been reopened, maybe... You've spoken about it too much and you need to zip the lip now. So Father, I pray that every wound that has been reopened, everything that has rerouted itself in any person's, in any person's life, I pray for deliverance to come once more, once and for all, God, that those issues would just be broken and pulled down. Any stronghold over them from the enemy would be smashed right now in Jesus' name. Every root severed, every single thing uprooted that is not of you, God, by the power of your spirit, every stronghold broken down, and I thank you for peace and deliverance to come to each one of your children in Jesus' precious name. Amen.